Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to a special photography edition of Iowa Outdoors. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. The Vredenberg Foundation of Sheraton, Iowa. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to a very special edition of Iowa Outdoors. Throughout our first four seasons, we've profiled photographers from every corner of Iowa. As they document our natural surroundings in nearly every detail possible from the sweeping lush hills of western Iowa to the smallest macro details of a prairie flower. These Iowa photogs have made it their passion to bring the outdoors to you in its most beautiful, high resolution form. First up, we'll rewind to a fan favorite from the watery depths of Okaboji, where a veteran photographer dives deep for both images and aquatic relics. Lloyd Cunningham has scuba dived all over the world, but his favorite spot is here in northwest Iowa below the surface of a popular tourist destination. I have a real passion for underwater photography and I have a real love of the Iowa Great Lakes and, and West Lake Okaboji. I've dived in the Clearwater Springs in Florida, I've dived in the Keys, the Caribbean, and even the Baja Peninsula, but this is my favorite place to dive. Weeks before a summertime rush of visitors, flood the cool waters of West Lake Okaboji, Lloyd Cunningham is already here. Donning a wetsuit with scuba gear in hand, Lloyd prepares for an icy dip in 40 degree water. It's a challenge. This is not recreational diving to dive in 40 degree water. And dives are generally short. Uh, I typically dive on, in this cold water uh, not more than once a day and a dive of not more than about 35 minutes because you will chill all the way to the core. This excursion is much more than recreation. It's a trip back in time. From a 1940s ice truck to 100-year-old structures, Cunningham opens an underwater gateway for the rest of us. The bottom of the lake is, uh, is uh, a time capsule, in my view, of collectibles, of interesting parts of the lake's history and past. That's, I think, the, the major draw of the lake for me. Every dive in West Lake Okaboji is a treasure hunt. Lloyd, a retired newspaper photographer for the Argus Leader in Sioux Falls, spent his weekdays documenting fires, accidents, and Friday night football. He spent his free time here at West Lake Okaboji. Much to the surprise of many longtime Iowans, this glacial water body is a hidden scuba diving gem. The lake is 134, 138 feet deep, depending upon where you actually drop your, your depth finder. And uh, uh, that depth lends itself to clear water. Anything that falls into the lake, sediment, silts, and sands that you'd see in Midwest lakes, uh, all settles through that top layer of uh, water down to the bottom, leaving the top very, very clear. Okaboji was formed by the Wisconsin Glacier more than 100,000 years ago. One of only three blue water lakes in the entire world, visibility can extend 40 feet during peak periods. However, that window is only briefly open. The spring days of mid-May present the best opportunity to catch a glimpse of the lake bottom. 
We journeyed alongside Lloyd from the water's edge to a structure brimming with fish. There is a tower uh, in the bottom of the lake. This was a water intake built by the city of Milford in about 1917. The tower is roughly 15 feet tall. It's a crib full of stone at the bottom and it holds upright an eight inch uh, iron pipe. Uh, it was built on the ice and then lowered to the bottom in 30 feet of water. That tower provided water uh, for drinking water and fire protection water for the town of Milford until about 1945. It's been replaced by other intakes now, but it's still a haven for panfish and a hunting ground for walleye and pike. Lloyd has clocked more than 350 dives in Okaboji, and while his first-hand accounts keep him coming back, it is underwater photography that has captivated residents and tourists alike. It was amazing to me the first time I was on the bottom of this lake, I recognized that I could actually make pictures here. Making a good underwater photograph is, uh, is uh, a balance of working with the water, working with the light, working with the visibility that you have, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, taking all those into account as you approach the dive and make the photograph. On the bottom of West Lake Okaboji is something called the ice truck. In 1948, uh, it slipped off the ice and sank into 22 feet of water in the middle of Smith's Bay. When I began diving in 1992, I'd heard that the boat, the truck was out there, uh, but I could not find anybody who had actually seen it, and most divers had assumed it had rusted away. It has become the most popular dive site, I think, on West Lake Okaboji now. Much of the floating matter in these images was stirred up by our divers. The swirling sediment can create a dark and hazy image. It's just one of the reasons underwater photography requires skill and patience. Good diving practice is that you always dive with a buddy, but when you, uh, when you uh, are diving in water is with, a, with the bottom as soft as this bottom that can easily be stirred up by a random or a clumsy kick of a fin, you lose the visibility that you're after when you're trying to make good quality underwater images. So in that case, I mostly dive alone. The ice truck, underwater shipwrecks, fish sanctuaries. These are images that have captivated Lloyd during his dives. But so have the stories behind them. Lloyd says his photographs have drawn the attention of local historians, always curious if he has come across a relic from decades ago. They'll have seen a, a boat sink from their uh, lakeside cabin and they want to know if I, want to, if I know the details. Or they'll ask me what I've seen at the bottom of the lake. Uh, it seems to generate a lot of discussion about what's down there. Every dive in West Lake Okaboji is a treasure hunt because you never know what kind of an artifact you may recover when you dive in this beautiful lake. Have you ever looked at a sunset and wondered how you could capture every detail from the bright highlights to the dark backlit sections? Well, you may want to stay tuned for our next segment. Iowa photographer Ken West is using high dynamic range photography to capture a very different view of the Iowa landscape. The photographs that Ken West takes have a surreal look. There is something about them that is not quite natural, something different that people have trouble identifying. And I think one of the reasons for that is because I use this technique called high dynamic range photography where I'll take several photographs of the scene, different exposures, allows me to capture a much wider range of brightness. People are not used to seeing that in a photograph. Where they're used to seeing it is in a painting. And so I think that's one of the reasons when people look at the prints, they think, wow, it looks like a painting. HDR, or high dynamic range photography, actually reduces the contrast between the darkest and lightest areas of a photograph. The process involves taking several photographs of the same subject at different exposures. A computer is then used to merge those separate photographs into a single HDR image. This is a photograph that I took in the Les Hills National Scenic Byway, which is located in the western part of Iowa. And to take this scene, I used, um, this is what it would normally look like here. You can see a normal photograph. I would have lost all the detail in the sun 
and in the sky, and also quite a lot of detail in the sh deep shadow areas. But by using a combination of three different photographs, one where I photograph using more exposure to capture shadow detail, and then two photographs where I uh, use less exposure so I can capture all of the detail around the sun and in the sky, and then I merge those all together, and then the result is this photograph called a high dynamic range photograph. It has a painterly quality because, frankly, only a painter could have captured that traditionally. Ken West has taught photography at the Maharashtra University of Management in Fairfield for five years, but he has been involved in photography nearly all his life. His great-grandfather had a photography studio in Missouri, but it was Ken's grandfather, who was a portrait photographer and painter, that taught Ken the basics. Some of my earliest childhood memories are sitting in the dark room with my grandfather, watching him develop 4x5, 5x7 sheet film in a tray, and then also watching him make prints when I was very small. So my interests um, developed very naturally and just progressed from there. Ken says his interest in landscape and nature photography began less than 10 years ago. He credits the Jefferson County Trail System for focusing his interest on the environment. For Ken, Photography is a means of experiencing the world. On the technical side, it might take Ken as long as 20 seconds to take the three to six exposures he needs to create a high dynamic range photograph. In order to keep the camera as still as possible, he always uses a tripod, uses a shutter release, and locks the mirror up in the camera to minimize vibration. So that his depth of field will remain the same from photograph to photograph, he brackets his exposure using shutter speed rather than changing the lens aperture. Many years ago, you were always told to have the sun over your shoulder. And I quickly learned, with, particularly with HDR, to throw that idea out. I like having the sun a lot of times as part of the composition itself. As a matter of fact, sometimes when I'm photographing the scene, I can't really look at the scene. I have to kind of squint and look at it sideways to frame it in my camera because it's too bright the sun to actually look right at it. The photographs Ken West has taken have been featured in a number of galleries across the state. He has also shown his work and conducted a workshop on HDR photography at the National Center for Nature Photography in Ohio. It is the only gallery in the nation devoted exclusively to landscape and nature photography. The goal of the center is to inspire a reverence for natural environments and to promote the preservation of the natural world. It is a goal that is shared by Ken. We have a role as stewards to nourish and protect the natural world around us. So I think that's a, a very important thing that people take away from my photographs. And I'd also like to remind people in Iowa when they look at the photographs, what a wonderful place Iowa is. And I encourage people to go out on the byways, take a, a Saturday or a Sunday or a weekend and do a byway trip, pick out one. And I think you'll, you'll find that you'll experience some really wonderful natural scenes, natural landscapes that are just exquisite. And you just have to take the time to go out and experience it. A stroll through Iowa's landscapes can make it easy to find nature's larger subjects, like a full grown oak or river trail. But don't be afraid to slow down and absorb life's tinier details. Because you might miss some of the small features like moss or just budding plants. These photographic subjects draw the attention of Cindy Ski, for whom the big picture starts very small. There's a chance that when you've been out enjoying one of the state's many natural wonders, you've passed by Cindy Ski as she was taking pictures and never even saw her. That's because when Cindy is photographing Iowa's wild side, she quite literally has to get down and dirty in order to capture the magnificence of what can best be described as a small world. I'm telling you, it's a whole other world in there. I enjoy being outside. I grew up with four older brothers. Um, our house had woods and creek in the back, and we pretty much lived down there our whole childhood, and you knew every inch of those woods, so. I always say, if I don't have some dirt under my fingernails, then I'm not doing something right, so. In a world that seems to embrace the concept that bigger is better, Cindy uses macro photography to make a miniature universe larger than life. 
Her images put you face to face with the things in nature that are usually stepped over, giving her pictures that, oh wow, appeal. One of the best compliments I get is when somebody tells me, wow, you know, I never looked at it that way before. Who knew fungus could be fun? But to me, fungus, whatever, growing on a dead tree, there's an entire world in there. It amazes me. And if you're walking by and you saw that snail on the leaf, it'd be a slimy little snail sitting on a leaf. And you get up close and wow, it, it blows my mind. When Skis grabs her camera and heads out on a shoot, she rarely has a specific subject in mind, and she never knows what it is that she will actually find. I'm working on a shot for my water drops, and then I eyeball all this <laughs> fungus, so all right. Focus. Even in something as spectacular as a large patch of bluebells, there is always a distraction that catches her eye and pulls her in another direction. When I was doing the bluebells, I started with the flower itself, then I started with the buds, because to me those are more interesting than the open flower. Then I started backing up a little bit, then I noticed the water drops, then I, my eyes really went towards the lichen that was on the dead limb laying in the grass. Then I found a little wildflower. Then it, it just goes on and on and on. Cindy says she has been taking pictures for quite some time and started exploring macro photography with her point and shoot camera before she got really serious about four years ago. The first subjects she focused her attention on were things she found in her own backyard. Her 2012 calendar, Beauty in the Backyard, is a collection of things she found there. I started gardening avidly and I originally started taking photos of all the different colors because I love color. I just kept getting more drawn to closer and closer shots and I'll look at something in my backyard still and just be amazed at what I see through the camera lens. One of the things Ski is always looking for is drops of water or sap. For her, it's not so much the drops themselves that she finds intriguing as what's behind them. She's even managed to capture a self-portrait using a drop of sap. And so I'm standing out there for all the world to see with a tripod and a camera and me on the other side of this trying to <laughs> take a shot. And so yeah, sap, sap and water drops. Cindy edits the images she's captured on her laptop and doesn't do much more than crop and size them. She tries to avoid any manipulation of the colors in her pictures. I'll compose a general shot, but it's not till I'm on my computer looking at it and seeing how sharp the image is and where the focal point is that then I decide where I want to do my cropping. So. And I try not to mess with color too much. I, I, typically, I don't have to. Sometimes I actually have to desaturate some of my colors because they are too vivid. You don't have to muck with nature when, when it's as beautiful as it is. Skis enjoys all aspects of photography, from the taking of the picture to preparing it for printing. And while she enjoys seeing how people react to her images, she finds exhibiting her work difficult. It's kind of like you're exposing yourself because I don't think I realized it until I started putting myself out there that, you know, you're sharing a part of yourself with, with everybody else. But the more I share it with people, the more fascinated they are. And, and, and I like when I hear people saying, oh, you know, I ought to get a macro lens. That looks like fun. Cindy always seems surprised when she looks in the viewfinder of her camera to see what she's just shot. And when she's out with her camera, it's as if she's on an adventure where there's plenty of treasure to be found. There's just so much to see, and people walk by this stuff every day. A lot of people don't realize you just walk out your back door, you know. You don't have to be in a park. You could walk down a Greenbelt Trail, stop on the side of the trail. You get down there and look, and it's just, it's amazing. A 
trip to the western rim of Iowa will inevitably lead you through a silt-heavy region known as the Lust Hills, a place with vivid possibilities before and after sunset. We'll take you to western Iowa to spend some quality time in the treetops with arborist Jeff Gruy, whose passion for pruning is only matched by a photographic appreciation of the Lust Hills at night. The Lust Hills, are ju it's just a word that doesn't have any meaning, nothing attached to it. It's a beautiful place that we should know about and that we should make an effort to preserve. And if you don't know about it, it may as well not exist, because it doesn't to you. And that's my effort to wake people up to there's something there to care about. For Jeff Gruy, the western rim of Iowa has special meaning. It's a natural landscape he visits to find himself and reconnect with nature. A setting he photographs under a full moon with dwindling light. A backdrop he may never have discovered if it wasn't for his first outdoor passion up above. On the opposite side of the Missouri River, you'll often find Jeff here, in the treetops. Climbing his way up, and slicing his way back down. This is not the Lus Hills, but rather a small river valley enclave known as the Ponca Hills, north of Omaha, Nebraska. It's one of the locations where Jeff has fostered his business, a tree pruning, trimming, and removal operation with a careful approach to natural landscape restoration. On an unseasonably cool summer morning, Jeff's team is clearing unwanted trees from a private acreage, opening up a natural landscape from the multi-generational growth of excess vegetation. A lot of sugar maples, there's some really tall tulip trees. There are some cedars that I'm not familiar with that I've not seen any place else around here. So it's, uh, I don't know, it's a real special property. It's sort of like this place was, this place and I were meant to come together. It's pretty neat. Jeff didn't grow up dreaming he would one day trim trees. After high school, he studied everything from computer science to chemistry. But there was something about climbing high above the tree line that caught his attention. It was this challenge, it was an adventure. It, tr climbing trees is fun, I mean, so you're not bored when you're climbing a tree or swinging around or figuring out how you're gonna rig this branch over a house. You're totally involved. It beats sitting at a desk. Jeff's passion lured the Omaha native to an ecological destination across the Missouri River in Iowa along the silty ridgeline of lust soil. Two years ago, you couldn't see anything you could, other than just a wall of cedars here. There wasn't any grass growing. Here at Folsom Point Preserve, south of Council Bluffs, volunteers spent more than a decade removing invasive cedar trees from the prairie landscape. The more that you come to this place, the more that you discover uh, the diversity that's here and the beauty that's here, or the, the beauty that remains, it's nothing like it used to be, the more evident it becomes this is something which needs to be saved. The restoration efforts may have been the draw for Jeff, but he brought something more than his chainsaw. My best photos are taken at night. For some reason, I can see great dim light. And that ability in this place uh, came together and made for a lot of beautiful photographs. Jeff's work exudes a dreamlike scene, where prairie grasses blur slightly in the breeze and the moon burns bright as the sun amidst the starry sky. So most of my photos here have been taken at night. Long exposure and at night, diffuse light produces sort of a magical world that doesn't really exist um, except for through the camera. 
and he found a unique spot where light pollution, ironically, illuminated the landscape. It unfortunately has this bungy um, industrial plant across the street. It creates this beautiful light pollution at night. I mean, it's this half mile stretch of really bright lights and at night, um, it's just this gorgeous lighting. Taking his long exposure efforts to the next level, Jeff used his DSLR for time-lapse imagery throughout the Missouri River Valley, a cascade of waste steam rising from a nearby coal plant and a time-lapse of thunderstorms racing across the Nebraska plains towards western Iowa hillsides. For Jeff, it's easy to say what came first, the tree climbing before the photography. One career, another creative. Both are passions he hopes can illuminate the Luss Hills for anyone ready to discover the wild places in their own backyard. Falling in love with trees woke something up inside me. Um, and I began realizing that there was so much more there that, well, it's there, you just don't know it's there. There's much, there's a lot here to explore and to discover. That wraps up this special photography edition of Iowa Outdoors. These were just a taste of some of our favorite photo features from our first four seasons. You can see even more online at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. And if you have any Iowa nature photography you'd like to share with us, feel free to contact us at our website. We'll leave you with some of our favorite photos, all showcased right here on Iowa Outdoors. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. The Vredenberg Foundation of Sheraton, Iowa. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Midamerican Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Iowa Communications Network. ICN's connectivity offers Iowa's rural hospitals and clinics access to telemedicine opportunities. Iowans can eliminate distance barriers by receiving medical treatment closer to home using remote specialists located miles away. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.